be speaking mainly on uh, Rosa Luxemburg and the, and the German Revolution. Uh, this year, it, it marks, a, as uh, Sam said, it marks the 100 years anniversary of, of the German Revolution. Uh, and I think it's very important for us as revolutionaries to learn the lessons from the revolutions, both those who, who succeeded, like the Russian, and also those who failed, like, like the German. And this January, it will be the 100 years anniversary also for the murder uh, on Rosa Luxemburg, and uh, Karl Liebknecht. Um, Rosa Luxemburg has become somewhat of an icon on the left wing. I think many people share these memes, these pictures with her quotes on, the, on Facebook and uh, on the internet, and, and a lot of people see her as an inspiration. Uh, but I would also say a lot of, most people don't actually know what she stood for, don't actually know her ideas, don't actually know the, the activities that she, that she made. Uh, and she is one of the most distorted figures on the left wing. Both the Stalinists distorted her views, uh, tried to make her into this soft, uh, anti-Leninist, anti-Bolshevik revolutionary. And a lot of the left reformists, they take the same, the same things that the Stalinists take, but they just say it's something positive, that she is something like a soft lefty, like an anti-capitalist, but not really a revolutionary. And I would say that is completely wrong. Uh, and I think uh, this 100 years anniversary of her death, that it's time that we as revolutionaries, as Marxists, that we reclaim the revolutionary heritage of Rosa Luxemburg and say she is, she is ours. She is not the left reformist um, icon. She, she was a true revolutionary. Um, she was one of the founders of the German Communist Party. She was one of the key uh, figures in the German Revolution. Uh, sadly, not for, for long, because just a few months into the revolution, she was brutally murdered in January 1919. Rosa Luxemburg was born in the Russian-occupied uh, part of Poland in 1871. Uh, very young, she was a Pole, she was a Jew, and she was a woman. So she, I think she felt depression uh, very, uh, how do you say that, very present in her life. And in a very young age, she became a revolutionary, already in high school. Uh, and and uh, before she was 20, she had to flee uh, Poland and had to go to Switzerland to study and to do revolutionary activity. Uh, and there she was one of the founders of the, of the Polish revolutionary movement. But I would say her main field of activity was that in the German movement, in the end of, of the 18th century, uh, in 1898, she moved to Berlin to be part of the uh, Socialist uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SPD. This was the biggest party in the Second International. Uh, it was the most important. It was the party that Lenin, at that time, saw as the model for, for a Marxist party. Uh, and she just threw herself into the discussions in the, in the Social Democratic Party. And all from the beginning, and I think this is also what we have to stress as revolutionaries, from the beginning, she was on the side of, of the revolutionaries. Uh, when she just moved to Germany, there was the debate uh, started by Bernstein, Edward Bernstein, that said, we have to revise Marxism. Uh, now Marxism will just gradually better the, now capitalism will just gradually better the lives of the workers. So we just have to focus on the movement for better conditions. We don't have to focus on the end goal of a socialist revolution. And Rosa Luxemburg was one of the, the harshest defenders of, of the need to, to keep the goal of a socialist revolution as the end goal of the struggles for reforms, as the end goal of the struggles for, for Marxists, that you can't just discard the struggle for socialist revolution, then you lose all uh, existence uh, for, for the party. And I think if we look at the social democratic parties today, that is uh, very clear that they're uh, essence of life has just become pillars of, of capitalist society. Um, and, and she could see that in the social democratic movement, both in Germany and internationally, uh, there was a process taking place adapting to capitalist society. There was a, an upswing in capitalism, there was a layer in the top, top movement that became adapted to negotiations, to to the economy going forward, to having negotiations with the, with the employers, and, and they just focused on these uh, small reforms. And she could see this process very clearly because she was in the thick of it. Uh, and she started to criticize this. 
and, and this process you could see, I think from, for Lenin, for example, who was away in Russia, he, he couldn't see it, uh, until it became apparent uh, in 1914, when the First World War broke out, in August, when the German uh, SPD voted for the war credits, which in effect meant to support the German bourgeoisie uh, in the First World War. And I would say, see, all the years in the two decades leading up to the German Revolution, she was one of the key figures in the struggle for the revolutionary ideas inside the Second International. Uh, and the last year leading up to the First World War, she was one of the key figures in the struggle against imperialism and the impending war that was clear for everybody was, was on the agenda, on the, on the horizon in, in Europe. Um, in, the, in the Second World War, there was a discussion on the nature of the war, that this would be an imperialist war and that the, that the task of the, of the social democrats, which at that time called themselves Marxists, not as, as the social democrats today, but at this time it was the international for Lenin, for, for Trotsky, for Luxembourg, for Liebknecht, for all these revolutionary figures basically. Uh, and and they, they discussed that the main task of the, of the social democrats when the war came was to oppose it, to be against it. And there was a discussion at the International Congress uh, in 1907 where Lenin and Luxembourg, they put forward an amendment to the revolution on war that was, um, that was um, accepted uh, by, the, by the international that said, if the war comes, the, the task of the social democrats all over the world is to oppose the war with, with all means that we have. And not only that, but also to turn the war into a struggle to, uh, how do they, they, they formulated it, uh, to strive with all their power to make use of the violent economic and political crisis brought about by the war to rouse the people and thereby to hasten the abolition of capitalist class rule. That is, to, to turn the war into a fight against capitalism. Uh, this was accepted by the Second International, but it, it became clear that in the top of the Second International, in words, they paid lip service to the ideas of revolution, of Marxism, but basically they had adapted themselves to capitalist society. And this, this became obvious on 4th of August, 1914. Uh, this was the day where, where the vote on the war credit was taken in the German uh, Reichstag, the parliament, and all the members of the SPD parliamentary group voted for these war credits. And it was a shock all over the international. Uh, year after year, the international congresses and the parties had voted to go against the war, and now suddenly, they, they all voted for the war. Uh, Lenin thought that the German paper, the Vorwärts, uh, that uh, described this vote, he, he thought it was a forgery of the German uh, headquarters. Uh, he didn't believe that this actually happened. But this showed how far the process of degeneration had gone in the top of the Second International and the German Social Democratic Party. Uh, and Rosa Luxemburg, she had seen this all along and had uh, criticized it and, and fought against it. Uh, and, and when the war came, she gathered a small group of people on the evening of the vote in, in her apartment to discuss what to do and to send out a resolution saying, not all German Social Democrats are in favor of this war. The problem was, this was a very small group uh, it was actually only a handful at this time. Uh, together with, uh, with a guy called Franz Mehring, she put out uh, a paper called The Internationale, uh, the international group. Uh, and this was, this was not a paper in the Leninist sense. This was not a national organizer. This was a paper meant to influence, uh, especially the social democratic uh, local party organizations. So it didn't have an organization around itself. It, it, it just had a network of people, and, and this small core of people writing uh, this magazine. But nevertheless, they were the only ones who put forward in the beginning of the war these ideas of, of the war being an imperialist war and the need to turn it into a fight for socialist revolution. Um, but at this time, I think when you sit here, you can be quite optimistic, we are quite many, <laughs> and we are more and more year by year. But at this time, in the beginning of the First World War, I think the situation has seemed quite bleak. The whole international had just betrayed everything they ever stood for. Uh, those people defending revolutionary ideas, not just, to, not just to be against the war, was a very, very small group on an international scale. 
Um, but underneath the surface, this process that Trotsky called the molecular process of revolution was taking place. In the beginning, it, it seemed like, like uh, the whole world supported the war, but underneath the surface, the discontent and the frustration started to build among the masses uh, internationally and, and also in, in Germany. Um, this uh, small network of Luxembourg, Franz Mehring, Klaas Zetkin uh, was joined by others uh, in, in this fight and very soon they were also joined by Karl Liebknecht. Karl Liebknecht, he was a, a, a parliament member, a Reichstag uh, member from the SPD and, and from that he had voted for the war credits. Uh, on 4th of August, but very soon he realized this was a mistake because it, it gave the picture that it was a group that was unanimous and, and it hadn't been a unanimous group. Uh, I think 14 out of the 110 SPD uh, members of parliament was actually had talked uh, for voting against, but they had been so loyal to party discipline that they had accepted the majority and voted in favor. But Karl Liebknecht, he, he realized that this was not a time to follow party discipline. This was a time to stand out uh, and to actually speak the opposition. Um, and in December of uh, 1914, the German government again asked for a vote on, on, on new war credits. And Karl Liebknecht, as the only one, stood up in parliament and voted against. And he was just, the parliamentarians was shouting at him, calling him all kind of dark and a lot of <laughs> very bad names. Uh, so it, it took a lot of courage, but it also made him into a symbol of the opposition against the war internationally. The name of Karl Liebknecht in the trenches uh, in France, in Russia, in Germany became, became the, the name and, and the icon of, of, uh, of actually somebody standing up to, to be against this uh, slaughter of, of the workers all over, all over Europe. Um, this small revolutionary force uh, of Liebknecht, uh, Luxembourg and so on, they, they were also further weakened by the fact that either they were called up to the army, Liebknecht was called into the army, or they were put in prison. Uh, Rosa Luxembourg, she had been sentenced already before the war for offending the Kaiser, the German Kaiser. And when the war began, she was sweeped up and put into jail. I think actually she was only supposed to be there a few months and they kept her a year. Then they let her out. She was out for four or five months and then she would, was put into uh, protection custody. So sh she wasn't sentenced for anything. She hadn't done anything wrong, but for her own protection, the German regime put her in prison. I would say it was more for their own protection and then just to put her in prison. The problem with this kind of sentence is you don't have an expiring date and you can't appeal. You can just sit there and wait for the, the revolution actually ended up freeing her. Uh, but I think it wasn't that obvious that that would happen when she was put in, in prison. And she wasn't the only one. A lot of the other revolutionary leaders was put in prison. Uh, it didn't stop their revolutionary activities. When uh, she was in prison, she wrote the uh, very famous uh, Junius pamphlet because she, she used the pseudonym Junius. Uh, and it was like the first, uh, Lenin greeted it, uh, it very enthusiastically as the first coherent uh, criticism of the, of the war fr from Germany. Uh, he also had some criticisms of the concrete content, but he greeted it as, um, he's saying, Written in a very lively style, the Junius pamphlet has undoubtedly played and will play an important role in the struggle against the ex-Social Democratic Party of Germany, which has deserted to the side of the bourgeoisie and the Jungas, and we heartily greet the author. Uh, this was the first time that the German revolutionary left put forward uh, a coherent analysis of the war and, and what to do. What Lenin also said, and his main criticism of this pamphlet was that it seemed that it was written by a very <coughs> isolated uh, group in Germany. And in this, he was correct. And this was the main problems of the revolutionaries in Germany when the war came and later when the revolution came, that they were a very small group and that they were very, very isolated. Um, in January 1916, uh, these, these people from the international group and, and other left-wingers, they met and they formed the Spartacus League. Uh, 
uh, and put out the, uh, decided to put out the Spark Spartakist letters. Uh, they were a network still inside the SPD, uh, and they tried to build up, but they were still, I would say, they were not an organization as, as we know it, uh, in a Leninist sense. It, it was not a cater organization, it was a network of like-minded people who looked to this Spartacus uh, letters uh, as, as a way of inspiration more than as a way of, of organizing around it. Uh, and that meant that when the, when the opposition to the war among the German workers began to, grew, to grow, uh, there were strikes, there was demonstrations, and the pressure inside the SPD began to grow. Uh, suddenly, not everybody supported, well, they didn't in the beginning either, but, uh, but the members of the Social Democratic Party, they began to, to express opposition towards the war. And, and um, a layer in the leadership, not just the revolutionaries, but also the more center uh, of the leadership uh, began to feel this pressure and began to openly oppose the war also. More and more MPs voted against the war, uh, more and more of the party leaders, the party papers began to actually speak out. And in the end, it ended in a split in the, social, uh, in the SPD in uh, January 1917 with the Social Democratic Party expelling, uh, almost, it ended up being almost half, uh, and they formed the USPD, the Independent Democratic Socialist Party of, of Germany. Uh, the old SPD had 170,000 uh, 170, members, and the USPD had 120,000 members. Uh, and this was a paradox. The Spartacists went with the USPD, the Independent Socialists, but they ended up with all the old leaders of the, of the center of the reformists, all those they had fought against for all these years. Bernstein, who put forward the re re revisionist ideas. Uh, Kautsky, uh, who, who Rosa Luxemburg had been in a fight with since 1910. Uh, all the old leaders of the SPD ended up in this new USPD. So it was a split that was completely on principle. It was not, and it wasn't even initiated by, by those who formed the USPD. It was initiated by the right-wing leadership of the SPD expelling them. So it was quite a big mess, you could say, with no clear, clear line uh, and no clear program. Uh, there was the Kautsky who was for pacifism and there was also Luxembourg for revolutionary socialism. So it was a very mix of, of people, you can say. Um, and, and all the old disagreements still existed. And this was the situation of the, um, of the German left when the revolution broke out. Like in, in the rest of the world, and as we saw in Russia, the discontent with the war uh, 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 built, uh, and this led to an outburst of frustration uh, both the, the slaughter in the trenches, but also the conditions of life for normal workers was just being harsher and harsher. The prices of food went up, uh, people were hungry, they were cold, uh, and there were, was uh, strikes, demonstrations, and this in the end uh, burst out into the German Revolution in November 1918. Uh, the, the drop was that it was clear that the German army was on the brink of defeat. Uh, the German high command, they wanted, uh, they wanted one last, how can you say, honorary action to save the honor of the German fleet. Uh, so they wanted to send the German fleet out. The problem was that for the soldiers <laughs> of the German fleet, they didn't want to save the honor of the German army on, on uh, behalf of their own lives. So they said, enough is enough. This time we're not going out. Uh, in Kiel, in northern Germany, they mutinied and it spread. <coughs> And very soon, uh, workers and soldiers councils were set, on, set up in the northern towns of Germany, uh, in the naval bases. The red flag was flying uh, over these uh, naval ships, uh, and the revolution spread uh, throughout Germany. And on the 9th of November, uh, in Berlin, was set up a workers and, council, a workers and soldiers council, uh, and the revolution had, had reached the, the, the capital of, of Germany. Uh, and this opened up a period yeah, a revolutionary period in, in Germany, uh, and I, I know Rob will speak more about that. But, but very, very quickly, uh, the German Kaiser abdicated, 
uh, and the SPD, the right-wing leaders of the SPD, stepped in to save the situation, uh, to try by reforms from above to divert revolution from below. They hoped that they could step in and save, save the revolution from not going too far, to just keep it within the boundaries of a bourgeois revolution, uh, of a democratic revolution, and not, and not uh, to go all the way to the workers taking power. Um, they got the majority in the councils, uh, and they also got into government along with the USPD, the Independent Socialists. Uh, and in some ways it was a situation that resembled uh, the situation after February in, in Russia, a period where there was uh, a double power, um, a bourgeois uh, government uh, and, and these councils, uh, both led by these, um, both led by these uh, reform, uh, moderate socialists, you could call them. Uh, this revolution was finally what freed Rosa Luxemburg from prison, uh, along with, uh, with other political prisoners. Uh, and right from prison, she, she, she went into this revolutionary uh, cauldron. She just stepped right into uh, demonstrations, speaking, writing, uh, editing uh, the, the Spartacus letters. Um, and, and, and what she said was, that the, S the SPD, the right-wing leaders, they're trying to defuse the revolution by calling a national assembly. What we should do is, the only way forward is for the workers and soldiers councils to take power. This is the only way uh, to go. We have to follow the Russian example, basically. Um, the Spartacists in this were still a very small minority. When the revolution broke out, they were 50 in Berlin. They were that is not a lot of people in a very, very uh, large uh, town. They were more people spread uh, across Germany. Uh, but they were still this quite loose network. Uh, they grew very quickly when the revolution broke out. Uh, they attracted the most radicalized youth. Uh, they were very revolutionary, but also very inexperienced and very impatient. And they looked to the Russian example, which was a good thing, but they, they couldn't see the experience of the, of the Bolsheviks, of the Russian revolutionaries, they could just see how they ended up seizing power uh, um, by an armed uprising. They couldn't see all the work that had gone uh, before uh, and, and the preparatory work that the Bolsheviks had, uh, had done. Because what happens in a revolution, what happened in, in Russia and what happened in Germany is a revolution, it awakens all layers, not just the most radicalized, it, it awakens uh, all these people who haven't been political maybe ever in their life, and they have to learn through their own experience, they have to test the reformists in practice. They can't just jump, or most of them, don't just jump uh, straight to revolutionary conclusions. So what Lenin said in Russia and was, uh, was that the revolutionaries had to patiently explain. And this was also the task of, of the revolutionaries in Germany. But it was not so easy to see if you are just been awakened to revolution and there's a revolution all around you and you're just impatient for something happening. <laughs> and all the old leaders, let's just throw them uh, to hell, basically. Uh, so very within a few months of the revolution, uh, the Spartacists, they decided to break with the USPD and form the Communist Party. Uh, so that was actually formed during the revolution on New Year's Day uh, between 1918 and 1919, they formed the, the German Communist Party. Uh, and, and here it was clear that the party was, I think three, three fourths of the, of the participants was younger than 35, and only one was older than 50. So it shows that it was a very young group, uh, and they were very influenced by these ultra-left ideas. For example, they, they, vote, they were against the majority against participating in trade unions because they were dominated by the SPD, uh, which was a mistake, um, and which Luxembourg opposed uh, and said, we, we have to work where the masses are to try and win them over. Uh, but Luxembourg, she was not so worried either. She said, well, it's a new party, and like uh, all newborns, it squeal, squeals in the beginning. We will sort it out. Uh, but the problem was that they had very little time to sort it out. Within the first week, actually, of the foundation of the Communist Party, the, f the major test came for, for, for the young party. Uh, the SPD, uh, it was clear there was a polarization. The USPD had just 
left the government, and the SPD, they decided to try and, uh, and provoke the masses of Berlin and provoke the revolutionaries by sacking the police director of Berlin, who was a member of the USPD and who was seen by the workers of Berlin like their, their guy, uh, that he would defend them. So they said, we sack him and we see what happens. Try to provoke an immature uprising, basically. And, and it did provoke a mass movement in Berlin. The workers, soldiers of Berlin, went onto the street and actually stayed there for days. The problem was there was no leadership. There was set up a committee, but they didn't know what to do. They discussed, they discussed to kick out the government, but they, they didn't have any plan to do it. So they just sat deliberating, and the masses was on the street for several days, and in the end they, they went home, and the SPD, they organized the Freikorps, re reactionary troops, to go in and just crush the revolution, basically. Um, and in this, I don't have much time, <laughs> in this they, they also stepped up the witch hunt against the Spartacists. The Spartacists hadn't organized this. The communists hadn't organized it. They were part of it, of course. Luxembourg was against this. She said it was immature that, that the Berlin workers would be isolated and, and crushed. Uh, but the SPD whipped up this, this witch hunt, and especially against the leaders, Luxembourg and Liebknecht. Uh, they put um, how do it, a prize on their heads. And Luxembourg and Liebknecht, they hit, but they refused to, to leave Berlin. Uh, they refused to leave the workers in Berlin, uh, so they just hid in different, uh, in different apartments. And on the 15th of January, that is two weeks after the foundation of the Communist Party, uh, they were taken uh, by, by soldiers uh, and uh, to, taken to a hotel uh, where they were killed on the way out. Uh, Liebknecht killed uh, trying to escape, which is not true, they just shot him. Uh, and Luxembourg was hit in the head with um, a rifle butt, and then she was shot, and then she was thrown into the Landberg Canal in the Tiergarten and was not found until May. Um, and I think we, we don't know what would have happened if, these, if they hadn't been killed. I think what we can say is that Luxembourg, had she lived, especially her, she, she, she would have had the authority to try and educate these young revolutionary forces of the young Communist Party of, of Germany and might have changed the situation. Uh, I will end by two, by two things. First, I, I will end by, I will say a quote by Rosa Luxemburg, which I think shows the essence of her, that she never lost, one of her main features, I think, was her uh, true belief in the working class and their, and their power and energy to overthrow society. The last article she wrote before, before she was killed, and I think that's quite prophetic, um, but she wrote, it, it's called Order, Order Prevails in Berlin. Order prevails in Berlin, you foolish lackeys. Your order is built on sand. Tomorrow the revolution will rise up again, clashing its weapons, and to your horror it will proclaim with trumpets blazing, I was, I am, I shall be. And I think this shows the essence. Uh, she was a true revolutionary believing in the, in the power of, of the working class. Her main, her main, the main problem was that she hadn't built an organization based on this idea. So when the war broke out, when revolution came, there was no organization to actually intervene in the movement. Uh, and I think this is the main lesson to take from her, beside her revolutionary heritage, is she may be excused, <laughs> because at that time they hadn't had the experience, uh, but we, we may not be excused, because we have the experience, uh, and we have to learn from it, so it wasn't a waste, uh, her life, what, what she did. So we have to learn from this and, and actually build this organization that can intervene when, when the masses begin to move. Um, and I think the last thing I will say is that she, and this we don't have time, she, she made many mistakes and had many weaknesses, but her main thing was that whatever she did and whatever she said, she did it for the right reasons. She did it for revolutionary reasons, and no one is perfect, no one has no faults. And, and I, would, I will end by this quote by Lenin, that I think sums up the essence of, of what she was. Uh, because 
after her death, a lot of people took forward, uh, took forward her weak sides. But what he said is, um, he called her an eagle. He quoted a Russian fable. Eagles may at times fly lower than the hens, but hens can never rise to the height of eagles. Uh, Rosa, in spite of her mistakes, was an eagle. And I think this is, uh, this is what we take from her. She was a revolutionary eagle, and her revolutionary heritage is our heritage, and we have to learn from her life and from her ideas. Comrades, um, it might seem pretty obvious that the task of revolutionaries is to study revolutions. We have to learn the lessons of the struggles of the working class in the past. We have to look at their failings as well as the victories in order to prepare ourselves for the inevitable movement of the working class at our time. The reason why we wanted to produce a book on Germany it was not because simply it was the anniversary, because we realized that we were entering a revolutionary period ourselves. And it's our task to build up the necessary forces in order to ensure that the revolutions we come across are successful. In 1918-1919, capitalism became very close to its overthrow. In fact, uh, it was Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, who said, we are now in a race with Bolshevism and the world is on fire. That was said in March 1919. And Germany really was the center of this revolutionary wave throughout Europe. And Germany was a, can be considered as a, a key. Trotsky said in 1930 that Germany was the key to the international situation. And you could say that was the case in 1918 because Germany wasn't a backward country. Germany was at the heart of Europe. Germany was the most advanced industrial state on the European continent. Had a very powerful working class with revolutionary traditions. And if the revolution had succeeded in Germany, it would have been the end of capitalism. The whole of Europe would have gone communist. And that was, uh, I, that was not only the feelings of... Uh, the capitalists were very worried about the situation, but also of Lenin, who after all said he was prepared to give up the Russian Revolution for a successful revolution in Germany. Because a German revolution would have changed the whole of, well, not just the fate of Germany, it would have transformed the whole world. A victorious German revolution would have changed history. There would have no, not have been a Second World War. There would not have been a Holocaust. Those tragedies would have been absent if the working class had been victorious in Germany. And therefore, it's very important for us, I think, to uh, understand these particular lessons of this great revolution of 100 years ago in November 1918. Of course, there are parallels with the revolution in Russia a year earlier, where the revolution was a spontaneous movement of the working class, which led to the overthrow of the aristocracy and prepared the ground for a proletarian revolution itself. There are those who tried to say, well, it wasn't really a revolution. And some bourgeois historians have written books dismissing the idea as, as a revolution. Of course, uh, for these bourgeois historians, they, they kind of uh, break out in a rash when they uh, hear the name revolution, and therefore try and play down these characteristics. We shouldn't be surprised with that. But it's even those on the left we actually have the same idea. 
He was an author I came across, uh, Gabriel uh, Kuhn, who wrote an interesting book. In fact, it was a, a compilation of uh, writings and documents of the revolution of 1918. And in the introduction to this work, he says, well, we can't be sure it was a real revolution. And this guy was uh, an anarchist, or at least with anarchist sympathies. He said, well, the jury is still out of whether it's a revolution or not. And I thought to myself, well, I know, I know re I knew juries have been out for a week or two, but for jury to be out for a hundred years and then come to no conclusion at all as to what this character of this massive movement was is rather surprising. This is clearly a revolution. If you define a revolution as a movement of the masses, of those who never in the past or usually participate in politics or in society in general, when they rise up and try to take destiny into their own hands, as Trotsky explained, that is a revolution. Whether it succeeds or not is another matter. But the fact that the masses are on the move are attempting to take power into their hands. In fact, they do have power in their hands. In February in Russia, the revolution led to the creation of Soviets and this tiny working class held power. And in 1918, in November, it wasn't the generals who put an end to the First World War. It was the sailors and the soldiers and the workers of Germany who rose up in revolution to put an end to the war. Of course, you will not hear anything about this in the uh, programs and the documentaries that will be shown in the next few weeks honoring the centenary of the First World War, the end of the First World War. But it is a fact, it's the movement of the German workers which put an end to this barbarism. It started, as uh, Marie pointed out, as a revolt against the decisions of the military in Germany to go off on an adventure in the North Sea, a battle with the, with the British forces. And from a mutiny on one ship, which, which was put down as a matter of fact, the mutiny began to spread to other ships until over 100,000 sailors were involved in this general mutiny in the North Sea at that time. In other words, it was uh, from a spark. You have the movement, the generalized movement of revolution, which ended up affecting the town, the city of Kiel, and from there spread throughout Germany itself. And spontaneously, the workers and the sailors created these councils, these Soviets, because that's what they were, committees, which took power into their hands, whether it be on the ships, or whether it be in the towns or in the barracks. Everywhere, the workers began to self-organize spontaneously. We take a, a leaf out of Rosa Luxemburg's uh, book. Yes, it was a spontaneous movement of the workers to take power into their hands. And the whole regime in Germany was suspended in midair. It is true that revolutions begin at the top by a split in the ruling class because they can feel the movement below them. And they attempt to uh, prevent this movement by either repression or by giving reforms. Either one is a mistake because either one will lead to a further provocation of the masses. A crack at the top gives them confidence. And this was precisely what happened. The big movement took place because of the disintegration of the regime itself. And the, the monarchy of the, of the Kaiser, the king, deliberately allowed parliamentary government to occur in October, led by Prince von Baden who uh, established a government in order to try and hold the situation. And they brought in, yes, the Social Democrats, 
were brought into that government and they were willing accomplices in order to, to, to hold back the situation. But of course, uh, it only provoked the situation more and prepared this, this enormous mutiny and revolution. In the words of uh, Jan Valton, who wrote his autobiography, Out of the Night, he was a participant of the revolution. And he says he talks about a, a big burly sailor who was uh, marching down the road with the rest of the, the contingent and saw an old lady who said, what's going on? What's, what's happening? What's happening? And he said, revolution, madam, revolution. In other words, it was instinctive in these workers. They knew what they were about, what they were doing. And of course, the movement of the workers led to a crisis within the regime. And this uh, Prince von Baden realized the game was up and demanded that the Kaiser abdicate. Of course, the Kaiser didn't want to abdicate. On the contrary, his advice was to his generals, General Greisner, who came to see him, you must take loyal troops with fire throwers, with bombs, and you're going to put this revolution down. And his answer was, Sire, you have no army. It has disappeared. And yet he couldn't believe this. And he stubbornly refused, as did uh, the Tsar in, in February 1917, because they were out of touch with what was going on. They refused to abdicate. And yet, without that abdication, there was no way they were, had a, any opportunity of holding this revolution back. And it was quite a, a funny little episode where the Kaiser learned of his abdication, not from his own mouth, but from the Chancellor himself, who he had appointed. And uh, the next day, he was on a, a train to uh, Holland, where he stayed until the end of his life. But the whole monarchy disintegrated. His uh, brother put on uh, false whiskers and uh, put a red flag on the car in order to escape to the border. You had uh, Prince uh, uh, Ludwig III of Bavaria pleaded with the uh, revolutionaries, please don't put a red flag on my castle. It's my private property. <laughs> Of course, they didn't. Uh, they ignored him, and he uh, voluntarily went into exile. Of course, behind these uh, this comic opera was obviously the uh, this, 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 this disintegration of the state, and what Marie said. He had a, a situation of dual power. The working class held power in its hands in Germany through these councils that were set up everywhere. They had arms. When the soldiers came back from the war, they were, they were armed. And therefore, the demonstrations that took place in all the cities, and in Berlin in particular, mass demonstrations were armed demonstrations. They had the power, and the old government was suspended in midair. But of course, uh, they had to rely upon the only people who could salvage the situation was the social democratic leaders themselves. And these social democrats had uh, risen to the top, if you like. And they were the, the reformists. They were the careerists. They were the, the democrats, if you like, who hated revolution and the idea of revolution. In fact, Ebert, who became the chancellor, said, I hate revolution like sin. In fact, he made a deal with uh, von Baden that he, was, he would take the, the reins of the government, providing that he would act to put the revolution down. And this great democrat, this social democrat, this leader of the social democracy, wanted to maintain the monarchy. He was to pleading with uh, Ian von Baden to take on the regency. They were desperate to maintain the status quo. But uh, von Baden said he didn't want it. That was enough. There was a poison chalice. And he'll have to note, you take care of everything. So they formed this, a, a government, a socialist government. But at that very time, the workers themselves were beginning to realize they needed their own government. 
And in Berlin, the uh, Workers' Council in Berlin took a decision that they would appoint a government of people's commissars, just like in Russia, made up of the Socialist Party uh, leaders, of the, of the SPD, of the Social Democrats, and the Independent Social De Democrats. But the workers themselves had taken the initiative. It was their revolution. They had power in their hands, but they, did, they weren't conscious of this power. A bit like the, the Russian workers between February and October, they had power in their hands in the form of the Soviets. They could have easily swept away the old regime, but they weren't conscious of this power. It required a leadership. It required their party to lead them, like um, Trotsky compared it, the party to a piston box. The energy of the masses is like steam. It's enormously potentially powerful, but unless it's, um, it's uh, concentrated, in a, in a piston box through a, a revolutionary party, then it can dissipate. And that's the real need for the revolutionary party. It allows, it, it brings everything together. It allows these forces to, to, to carry through, if you like, the, the last step of the sweeping away of the old order and the consolidation of the working class itself. Of course, in Russia, they were lucky they had the Bolshevik party of Lenin and Trotsky, which is built up of the previous 10, 15 years. And they were able, they were dedicated to the overthrow of capitalism, prepared to go all the way. And on that basis, they had a successful revolution in Russia. Within the space of nine months, they had a second revolution. In Germany, in October, sorry, in November 1918, it was the February Revolution. That's what it was. And the, and the way was being set for a new October in Germany, provided they could build a leadership in time. Because the workers instinctively looked to their old parties that they had built, that they had created, their traditional organizations. And in this context, it was the Social Democratic Party and also the, the independent party, they were their traditional organizations. And power, if you like, was handed to those leaders in order to carry through the revolution. So on the 9th of November, these workers' councils said they should form a call for the formation of a workers' government, of commissars. The only thing is that Prince von Baden I just asked the Social Democrats to form a government. So here's the contradiction. Yes, they, they form a government, and they ask for the left to join the government, the independents, in order to get, give them a left cover. Because the whole object of, of Ebert, of Scheidemann, of Noska, the main leaders of the Social Democrats, was to restore law and order, or put an end to this revolution. And all they wanted was to have uh, a kind of democratic republic where they could be uh, a democratic loyal opposition, basically. And they squandered the potential for the revolution. Not that they squandered it, they betrayed it. They deliberately called on the workers to, to leave the streets, to go back home, to go back to the factories, to have law and order restored. Only thing is, they had no means of restoring this law and order. And the workers were on the streets. They were mobilized. They felt their power. And the only thing, the only people they could rely on that is the government was the old order. And above all, a reactionary elite called the Freikorps, which was a, an armed reactionary mob which got trained again, fighting against the Bolsheviks. They were being courted, they were being trained in order to march on Berlin to put the workers in their place. But of course, uh, there's a time and a place for everything. The revolution was red hot, if you like. The workers were on the move. Yes, they had a government, but the government itself had to give concessions, and so did the ruling class. 
The only hope for the, for, the, for the bourgeoisie in Germany was to give concessions. So the workers are demanding the right to organise. So they allowed trade unions, which were illegal before. The right to vote, the right to strike, all the democratic rights were now granted to the workers. Even the eight-hour day was granted to the workers, grudgingly. The capitalists couldn't afford it, but they had to give it. And the workers felt the power that they were achieving something because they won these reforms. But the rule of the movement was uh, detracted, if you like, was sent down a wrong path by these leaders talking about, forget the, the, the councils, let's have a national assembly, let's have democratic elections, that's what we want. And of course, the Labour leaders, whether you like it or not, had authority. They were the leaders. And they were able to uh, convince, I would say, a congress of uh, workers and soldiers' councils that this was the best way forward. That is, to give up their power and look towards the election of a constituent assembly or a national assembly. And that was a end of the first phase, if you like, of the, of the revolution. But of course, the, behind the revolution was the counter-revolution. That the only way the ruling class could, could get back in the saddle was not just put an end to the revolution, but, go, but carry through a counter-revolution. And the only way they could do that was arms, an armed struggle. They had a coup, actually, on the, an attempted coup on the 6th of December. And it failed because of the movement of the workers. They tried again on the 24th, the 25th of December, where they tried to provoke the workers. There was a, a regiment in, in Berlin, the Marine Regiment, and they tried to get it out of Berlin. And they sent troops against it. But the troops mutinied and fraternized with those sailors. In other words, every time they attempted to undermine the revolution, they were, they are, the means they were, were employing were being undermined through fraternization. But by January, as Marie says, they again tried to, to provoke the workers in order to try and crush them. Um, and that's what uh, happened in the so-called Spartacus week of January the 5th, of January the 12th, uh, 1919. Led to the, to the murder of hundreds of workers and a witch hunt to, 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 to undermine and destroy what they saw as the main danger, the Spartacists. Because they were the most dedicated of all. And they had leaders who had enormous authority in, on the 9th of November, the beginning of the revolution, mass, a mass demonstration took place outside the Reichstag of the parliament, and the first speaker was Liebner, Karl Liebknecht, who was well known, as was explained, he was a, 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 an MP, a deputy, he defied the war, he'd gone to prison, and he called on this mass of workers in front of him. What we want is not a bourgeois republic. What we want is a workers' republic, a Soviet republic. All those in favor of a Soviet republic. And there was masses who voted in favor of that, uh, that to take power. And that was an indication of the burning revolutionary mood in society. But they didn't have the party to pull it together, these were individuals. And you can't have the working class at fever pitch all the time. This exhaustion will take place. And that's precisely what happened. The revolution was sidetracked. The revolution was betrayed by the social democratic leaders who then tried to drown it in blood by the murder, not only of Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, but many others. And they set the free the Fry Corps, this reactionary semi-fascist gang on workers throughout Germany itself. But you know, a revolution is not one act. A revolution has many acts. In fact, revolution and counter-revolution can, can, can come close together. And the whole of the experience from 1918 to 1923 is the shift between revolution and counter-revolution. 
Every time there's a movement towards counter-revolution, it is like, the, as Marx said, the whip of counter-revolution pushes the revolution forward. And therefore, you have these events, huge events, which transforms the, the situation. Counter-revolutionary events and revolutionary events, which changes the working class, changes the organisations of the working class. Because in the end of 1920, these, the independents, this big party, votes to join the Communist International, which is formed in February 1919. And they have something like 800,000 workers at that time to, jo to join a communist movement. So the Communist Party becomes a mass party in 1920. And by that time, you had ca the Capuch. They have the whole series of, of uh, battles that take place in Germany, culminating in the crisis of 1923 which was a, a revolutionary situation with the occupation of the Ruhr by the French army because the failure of the Germans to pay the reparations from the First World War. And that sparked a spontaneous revolutionary movement, but this time, unlike the Spartacists, which had a handful of people in, in, uh, in Berlin and throughout uh, uh, Germany, then you had a mass communist party and they could have taken power in Germany in 1923. But unfortunately, given the, the uh, advice from Zinoviev and Stalin in particular, the leaders of the Commerce International, they told him to go easy, told him not, not to provoke the situation, allow the fascists to move first. It was, was their uh, uh, advice to the movement. And it resulted, although they they had potential power, they resulted in a debacle because they, 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 they hesitated, they prevaricated instead of organizing a decisive challenge for power itself. And as a result, they gave up and there was an ebb in the movement. Germany is full of tragedies. But even Trotsky explained that the, the potential revolution even existed right up to 1930, just before Hitler came to power. But it was the mistakes, the Communist Party became Stalinized, and you had the split in the working class movement itself, which led to the tragedy. The biggest Communist Party in the world, the biggest labor movement in the world, shattered. And that was because of a lack of leadership, a lack of program, which is a, which is a key ingredient, if you like, for the success of a revolution. And our task, yes, is to to uh, see this as part of our heritage. We have a responsibility to learn and understand what happened in Germany, to prepare ourselves for the events that are coming in Britain, in Europe, America, and the world in the coming period. That we have to prepare in advance. It's no good trying to create a revolutionary party when the revolution is here. You have to create it in advance. You have to create the cadres, you have to create the network, you have to create the embryo of the party. And it's events that will create, if you like, will affect the minds of the masses, will transform the situation and prepare the ground for a building of a mass party itself. But it cannot be done spontaneously. It has to be prepared and has to be prepared in advance. That is why we treat this theory seriously. Marxism can be defined as the historical experience of the working class. We are the memory of the working class, as opposed to the reformists who have no memory at all. We learn, we, uh, we absorb, we prepare in order that the revolutions which are coming, no doubt about that, we understand what we want is a successful revolution. And just as Germany was the key to the international situation, now there are many keys, many potentials. And one successful revolution in one country of the world where it will, in the words of uh, Woodrow Wilson, set the world alight, set the world afire. And on that basis, you can have a successful revolution on a world scale. It's much more favorable now than ever before. The working class, even in Germany, was a sizable section, but 40% of the population were peasants. 
Today, the peasantry has been eliminated. The working class is stronger now than ever before. But it cries out for a leadership, a Marxist leadership, that's prepared to go all the way. And that's our task. That's what we will fight for. And that's why, yes, in the words of Rosa Luxemburg, socialism or barbarism, it is barbarism under capitalism. We have to fight for that alternative now to win the youth, to win the workers, the fight to overthrow capitalism and really pay homage to those heroes who tried in vain in the past. We have a duty to carry the victory ourselves forward to a conclusion. Comrades, that's the way forward for our class.